Good morning. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much. Um, there's a chance when you heard me say last week that I was going to be talking about um, exploring questions of AI or artificial intelligence and its impact on the soul. You might have thought, well, I don't have much experience with AI. I don't know what it, you know, exactly how it impacts me, so I'm not sure it's going to be relevant. But the fact is, all of you, every single person, I can almost guarantee it, has used AI in the past 24 hours, likely more than once. If you've used any voice assistants, such as Siri or Alexa, you've used AI. If you've used Google Maps or Apple Maps, you've used AI. If you've clicked on a you might like um, recommendation on Netflix or on Amazon, if you've appreciated your spam filter keeping out ads for toenail fungus medications and fat burning pills, then you have used AI. And if you've let your texting program predict the next word that you might type, you've used AI. It's infiltrated, it's in, I knew I was going to trip on this word. It's infiltrated almost every part of our modern lives. And even if you consider yourself something of a Luddite, you still likely depend on AI for some aspect of your very comfortable existence. Thinking about this topic made me reflect on my technology with, or my relationship with technology through the years. I'd venture to guess that most of you in this room did not grow up with computers. Am I right about that? Like, <laughs> um, and the only parallel I have to that, being born in 1971, is that I didn't grow up with the internet, a fact for which I am forever grateful. <laughs> My first experience with computers was in fourth or fifth grade, I can't remember. I was part of what was then called a gifted and talented program, which meant I got to leave regular class time and go to the school library and, among other things, play Oregon Trail on the Apple IIe computer in the lab, and I could trade ammunition for food, I could fix wagon wheels, and eventually die of um, dysentery. <laughs> I almost said dystopia. That could also kill us, too. My next meaningful technology experience was a single semester in high school when we learned how to make smiley faces or write our name using code of zeros and ones. Fast forward eight years. That's not very much time when you think about it. Eight years in my internship at the Milwaukee Symphony in 1996 when, working alongside my future husband, I helped build the symphony's very first website with a program called Hot Dog. <laughs> I have no idea how they came up with that name. About 10 years later, I was building my own website for my first business. Now computers are so ubiquitous, so integrated, that we barely notice them. Preparing for this morning, I used dictation to type out portions of this talk because I wrote down my initial ideas using my Apple Pencil on my iPad. I work with most of my coaching clients on Zoom. When I'm out photographing, I can go out with a single memory card. I can take 5,000 photos, then see them a few minutes later when I upload them into my computer. There, I can dig digitally manipulate them to either match the vision I saw in reality, or I can create a completely, entirely new interpretation. It's in those moments that I actually do adore technology. Even in the time I've been seriously photographing, the technology has advanced. What used to be revolutionary, instead of having to go to a dark room, you could just look at the image on the computer, you could zap out a few dust spots. Um, you, I, I think of, I, I actually enjoy getting rid of spots on, on the computer, because I, I imagine it's like digital um, popping bubble wrap. You know how satisfying that is? Right? So that's how I, I uh, do it in my mind. I can correct exposure and I can correct color. I can do a bit of cloning. All of those things that used to be revolutionary are now very basic. And just in the past few weeks, updates to Photoshop, we're all familiar with Photoshop, at least in that airbrushing and creating the perfect um, face and model in our magazines. Updates to that program use AI to completely change a scene. I can take a photo of a woman sitting in a coffee shop, and with just a few clicks, I can transport, transport her into a lecture hall or to sitting on a beach. Now, it's true that that technology has existed for a while, but it's now much more accessible, and it's become much more realistic. And speaking of realistic, you've probably heard of deep fakes. 
Is there anyone that has not heard of deep fakes? Well, deep fakes are images, videos, and recordings that have been created from thousands of other data points that come together to create a very realistic version of someone doing or saying something that they likely never did or said. When the news about deep fakes and how much easier they were to create really started to come into the mainstream, and this was just back maybe about 2018, that's when I started getting nervous. Anyone could take an image of a celebrity and put them in compromising positions, or politicians and make them say and do things that they never said or did. And then there are normal people with all of their images, us, all of our images on Instagram and Facebook and other social media sites that anyone can just grab and manipulate. And mostly that grabbing and manipulated has been used for evil, as in you've probably heard of revenge porn. Um, where people are pasting photos of people on, um, in compromising positions. Um, but this deep fake idea, it's opened up a portal to a world where we can't trust what we see with our own eyes. And even though back then I was nervous about the implications of that kind of technology, it still felt like it was out there. And though it was perhaps a crisis, it wasn't a personal existential one. And now, as I really explore my identity as an artist and a creative person, it is getting personal. It's making me ask questions at the heart of today's talk. What soul got to do with it? And really, this goes with our C3's just cause when we're asking ourselves, what are the biggest um, challenges we face and how do we respond to those challenges? And I do believe that AI is one of those biggest challenges that we face. It is an existential, existential um, question. And depending on who you talk to, it's going to save humanity or it is going to be the apocalypse. When I'm talking about soul, I mean our essence and our highest selves. And by it, as in what soul got to do with it, I generally mean creativity and expression. That's one aspect that I'm going to explore a little bit this morning. I love technology when it helps me to be more effective or efficient or it does things for me that I'm not good at or don't really want to do. But now it's starting to morph into being um, a means, it, it's morphing from being a means to an end to being the end product itself. And that should give us all cause for concern. As I mentioned, I know technology has manipulated reality for a long time, but this feels different. Not only is the technology getting smarter and more sophisticated, but it is also more easily distributed because of email and social media and texting. Over the past six months, AI programs such as ChatGPT and MidJourney, which creates AI images, have enjoyed increasingly larger audiences. The creative world has been consumed with conversations about AI and its impact on the livelihood of artists. Anyone any one of us can sit down at a computer, type in a few keywords or phrases, and hit enter, and within a few seconds, get an image or prose that might pass for good enough. Since that's the case, why would a business hire an illustrator, or a photographer, or a musician, or a writer, who might cost a few thousand dollars and take from a few days to a few weeks to produce something? And then, even then, there's no guarantee that it's going to be exactly what they're looking for. And that takes more time and more money to work out. At this point, the AI Pandora's box has been opened, and there's no putting the lid back on. How can a business concerned with the bottom line justify spending time and money on a human being when they can get something in a matter of seconds, seemingly for free? So creatives need to come up with a new pitch. What do they have that AI doesn't? And I would say soul. Right now, AI is a bright, shiny object. It's seen by the average person as this really cool thing to play with, and it gives you kind of a sense of power. The technology is designed to be addictive and seductive. But as with most things that come out with lots of hype and become super popular, this will eventually self-correct. At least, I really hope it does. I hope that the positive uses for AI take the lead, including improvements on the conveniences that I list at the top of this talk, um, as well as doing good in the world, increasing our efficiency, and maybe even supporting disabled people with having more independence. 
The dark side, though, is very, very dark. And not to be overly dramatic, but our souls are in the balance. In the beautiful words that Cindy shared, we are either looking at being in the womb or being in the tomb. I'm not just talking about artists. Every single person here, everyone in this room, is a meaning-making creature. We need to create. We need to tell our story, share how we see and experience the world. It doesn't matter if we make widgets or woolen mittens or watercolors. We all have different ways of expressing ourselves, and they all matter. There was an interesting YouTube comment on a video about AI from someone who said he was a carpenter and a furniture maker. And I thought of Wayne as I was reading this. Um, he wrote, AI will never replace me. To which another person replied, I hate to tell you, but it already has. You should just get the equipment, by which I'm guessing he means like a 3D printer or you know something of that nature. Let it do the work, then sit back and enjoy the profits. Do you hear how sad that is? I mean, that just it kind of broke my heart. It cuts out the soul, the heart, and the intellect. It delegates that person's creativity to a machine. And yes, there is some creativity that's involved in programming that machine to create something specific. But maybe that carpenter likes the smell of the wood, the satisfaction of sanding down a beautiful cut of pine into a smooth surface putting it all together, and then enjoying a meal that probably tastes a lot better because it's being served on a table that he made. One thing I enjoy and that feeds my soul is taking pictures of flowers, especially dahlias. It's true that I can sit down, I can open up an image generating AI program and type in red dahlia surrounded by yellow dahlias. The result might be an objectively beautiful image but the end product will never, ever reflect the joy of finding or creating that scene for myself. Making the image is the image. It represents the sum total of my experience. It's where I was, it's what I was thinking, my mood, who or what else was there, what drew me to that object or subject in the first place, trying to translate my vision and imagination into something interesting, mysterious, beautiful or provocative. It's not just the result that matters, it's the entire context, the story around it that makes it beautiful. And that context includes the way the experience changed me, because I am never the same person when I finish the creative experiment as I was when I started. So that leads me to the question, what happens when you consider the source? If you saw an image that you loved, maybe a red dahlia in a field of yellow dahlias, and you thought it was a photo, but in reality, it was artificial intelligence. Would you feel differently about it? And if you knew that it was a photo that I took in real life, does it matter that it has a backstory? Does it matter what that story is? There was big news a few months ago when the results from the Sony photo competition, which is the big international annual competition, when those, those um, awards were announced. Immediately after the announcement of the winners in different categories, the winner of one category revealed that he had made his image using AI, and he declined the award. Of course, he had not told the judges that it was AI, or else he would have been disqualified, because to their credit, almost every photo competition out there disqualifies AI, or they might have a special category for it. In a follow-up interview, he said he wanted to make a statement about AI and spark a conversation about its benefits and challenges. And while I find his approach to forcing the question a bit unsettling, I'm glad he did it. We need to accelerate our understanding of the impact of AI on the arts. But to shift gears for just a moment, because we are in a spiritual setting here, you might think that religion would be immune from the spread of AI, but you would be wrong. Consider the reaction to a church service created by AI in Fourth. I hope I'm saying that right, Fourth, Germany in the past month. According to the story run by the AP, the chat GPT chatbot personified by an avatar of a bearded black man on a huge screen above the altar preached to the more 
three, more than 300 people who had shown up on a Friday morning for an experimental Lutheran church service almost entirely generated by AI. Many attending the service were impressed with the results, but it still noted the overuse of platitudes and a feeling of disconnection. One 31-year-old Lutheran pastor who attended said that he missed the emotion and spirituality that informs his sermons. The article covered some of the positive aspects of AI, including pastors using it to craft sermons so that they have more time to visit congregants and attend to other spiritual duties. But it did end with a note of caution, saying the experimental church service also showed the limits to implementing artificial AI in church or in religion. There was no real interaction between the believers and the chat bot. <laughs> What a sentence, <laughs> the believers in the chat bot, which wasn't able to respond to the laughter or any other reactions by churchgoers as a human pastor would have been able to do. The pastor is in the congregation. She lives with them. She buries the people. She knows them from the beginning, the experiments leader said. Artificial intelligence cannot do that. It does not know the congregation. I might take some comfort in that except that we're already in a period where AI people are available for friendships and more. Flesh and blood human beings form what feel like real relationships with entities that do not exist, and they pay a lot of money to do this. They can carry on full conversations and feel emotional comfort from them, or it was at least what they perceive as emotional comfort. Meta who you might know as the parent company of Facebook and Instagram, is developing a program called VoiceBox that can sample just a few seconds of your voice and then make you say anything they program it to say, including your inflections, your tone of voice, your speed, all of that. And just around the corner are new movies and songs being released featuring your favorite dead actors or singers. It's already happening. Back in September, a 33-year-old Belgian developer created a 3D deep fake version of Elvis Presley performing. The AR installation was shown during the show America's Got Talent. Now, don't get me wrong. I think it's kind of, it's, it's super cool. The developer put in close to 1,000 hours to create that deep fake. It's nostalgic and kind of amazing to see a long dead celebrity appear before you seemingly in the flesh. But what would you do if someone told you, I can create a 3D deep fake version of your deceased spouse or child or best friend? You'd be able to hang out and have conversations like you used to. I think that's already been a Black Mirror episode. If anybody hasn't watched Black Mirror on Netflix, I highly recommend it, especially if you want to be a little scared. <sighs> Maybe you wouldn't take them up on that offer, but plenty of others would. After all, it's like the virtual fountain of youth. In some ways, you'd never die. And what's the implication of that for our souls? What if death of the body didn't really mean we were dead and gone? Perhaps a world without grief and mourning sounds like a utopia, but I'm not so sure. Part of what gives life meaning is the search for meaning and knowing that we only have so much time. There's a saying that says, um, if it weren't for the last minute, nothing would get, ever get done. I'm living proof of that. <laughs> Most of us need deadlines, and death is the ultimate deadline. I don't mind that my life has a sense of urgency. Some days, though, not even death is a motivator. So I'm not sure what would happen if I knew that I could continue to somehow live after my bodily death. But let me take you back to AI and creativity. At least in the short term, I don't think it's going to completely replace human creativity. It might be able to write a term paper on the French Revolution for a high school student, but it's not sophisticated enough to handle nuances in poetry, for instance. As part of this, I decided to install, and I will say I wrote all of this. I did not use chat GPT. <laughs> that was asked in the pre-talk, and so I can, I can guarantee I wrote this. But I did decide to install the app on my phone and give it a test run. Like, what's all the fuss about? And I entered the prompt, can you write me a poem about the soul? 
And here are three stanzas of the seven stanzas that it had produced literally in two seconds. In depths unseen where essence dwells, a mystery unfolds the soul it tells. A flame eternal, an ethereal light, gliding, guiding us through darkness, shining bright. The soul, a tapestry woven with care. <laughs> Thank you. It's like, please have mercy, make it stop. I didn't even get to say, yet in its depths, resilience does grow, transforming wounds into a vibrant glow. Ah, oh, oh my gosh. Thank you for stopping me on that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, okay, I'll give it another chance. You know, it's a little sing songy, rhymey for me. So I gave another prompt and I said, can you write me a poem about the soul that doesn't rhyme? <laughs> Any guesses as to what happened? Here's the first of seven stanzas. I'll just, I'll only give you one this time. In the depths of being where mystery resides, the soul finds solace where identity hides. Unbound by conventions, it yearns to explore, unveiling its essence, seeking truth at its core. <laughs> Clearly, it doesn't know what I meant by does not rhyme. So much for that. Um, and I love it. When I shared this in pre-talk, Leslie said, well, there's, you know, it's, it's hard to have, you know, for a chat bot or something to have the I in poetry. Like, there's always an I. And she said, there's no I in AI. And I was like, ooh, I like that. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> now, I could take that poem. Well, first, I could take chat GPT, and I could work with it longer than just giving it a prompt. I could get more specific. I could spend more time. Um, I could sort of teach it a little bit more about what I was looking for. I actually did do a couple of prompts where I said, would you write me a poem in the style of Mary Oliver? And what was interesting is that it knew Mary Oliver um, used a lot of nature metaphors and whatnot. But I could tell as I was reading it that it was more like an ode to Mary Oliver because it said something at one point, oh, oh, Mary Oliver, blah, 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 blah. You know, so, and then I said, I thought, well, okay, let's get more specific. Let's do, can you write me a poem in the style of E.E. E. Cummings? <laughs> Which would be very different, right? And it's talked about, I don't use punctuation and lowercase letters and all this kind of stuff. So it was, it was about E.E. E. Cummings, but not in the style of. Like I said, if I had trained it, spent more time, maybe I would have gotten something. But at least on that surface experiment, um, it was more a source of amusement. Now, I can take that poem. And this is the way a lot of folks, I think, are using AI. I can take that poem and use it as a starting point for my own poem. Like if I was just having this creative block and I was stuck and I just needed a few words, rather than staring at a blank page, I can say, you know, throw out some things and I can start to tweak it. But in that case, is that poem really my own? Did I co-author it with ChatGPT? If I didn't start with a blank piece of paper, can I claim that it's 100% my original work? And that's acknowledging that all of it, everybody is getting inspiration from everywhere. It's just most of the time or often it's subconscious. It's like what we've absorbed and synthesized from multiple sources. And, and when we say, I don't know where that came from, it did come from somewhere. It's just, you know, kind of buried in our subconscious. Um, and so we can still say that came from me because I put it together in a way that hadn't been put together before. Um, and then, you know, then there's also the questions that also get into like copyright and legalities, you know. What about the data that ChatGPT used to create the poem? Because it is creating the poem, pulling on data points of other poems. And so what it's learned about other poems about the soul, it knew to use words like depth or mystery or solace or explore, essence. Um, you know, it's putting those together in a different way, but you still, you still have to wonder. And this comes up in AI with photography as well, because it's pulling on and it's creating something new and it's learning. That's the creepy thing. Some people will say, well, it's not pulling, you know, pieces of other people's images and putting them together in a new thing. It's learning what a person um, on the edge of a cliff looking out over the ocean looks like and it's creating one that hasn't existed before. But it's learning that from all the other images that people have taken of someone standing on a precipice and looking out over the ocean. 
So for many, and I would say most or maybe even all creative people, the joy is in the process of creating, which AI compromises. It's the imagination, it's possibility, it's trying to find just the right word or color or line or note or choreographed step that resonates the most and expresses what's in the heart and the soul, that communicates the very special way that they see the world. I know I get a little rush of endorphins when I put together words in a way that pleases me, or I capture an image with my camera that feels like it has some sort of special energy or spirit. What will it do to our souls and feelings of humanity and connection if art and poetry and music all come from algorithms? Right now, a human being must prompt the AI, but what happens when one AI source prompts another? What about when they start to talk to each other instead of us? Again, consider the source. AI is drawing from millions of data points made up of all of those ones and zeros that I loved in high school when I first learned to use a real computer. Is something still beautiful and valuable if an image or poem is made from algorithms and keywords? Or does it need a personal spark, imagination, an impulse or instinct, or a decisive moment? This question of beauty and value makes me think of a conversation I had yesterday with Andy, my husband, about real versus fake plants. <laughs> I bought some ferns to put out in front of our portico, and he said, you know, those won't last very long. And I said, hmm, how long? And he said, oh, maybe four or five months which is much longer than what I thought he would say. I thought he was gonna say like two weeks. So I was like, phew, okay, I can live with that. But nevertheless, he suggested getting some high quality fake plants for the outside front because no one would really be able to tell and they'd be the ultimate in low maintenance. But we both agreed that inside the house, only real plants would be acceptable. Why? Because they're breathing, they're alive. They coexist with us in our private space and there's a reciprocity of oxygen and nitrogen that benefits us both. It's here that I wanna to refer to that first reading that's in the bulletin. It says, some people worry that artificial intelligence will make us feel inferior, but then anybody in his right mind should have an inferiority complex every time he looks at a flower. Alan Kay, he was an American computer scientist um, and you know, that's, that's a returning to mystery to me. On some level, it's a reminder that plants have a soul. They have a mystery and inspire wonder. They have a complexity that is unmatched by any machine, at least when you consider that they grow from a seed with little to no help from us. The plant example reminds me that there's a room, that there's room for both in the world. Fake plants serve a purpose that's useful, but they have their limits. They won't replace all real plants. I know it's a bit of an apples to oranges comparison talking about fake plants and fake Elvises, but somehow it puts things into perspective for me. I said that, you know, creatives are having this existential crisis of, you know, what if AI replaces me? And botanists, and growers of houseplants might have had a similar existential crisis when fake plants went mainstream. Why would anyone buy a real plant again? It needs to be cared for, and even when you care for it, it will die. But last I checked, the garden section at Menards and the dozens of greenhouses in West Michigan prove that there's room for both the real and the artificial. So maybe I've talked myself down a little bit from the existential edge at least for now, and maybe AI isn't the end of the world as we know it. But we can't be passive consumers if we want to sustain a healthy, soulful both and existence. If we want to have a say in the future of our world, we have to keep asking ourselves, with all of this technology, what's at stake? And are we willing to make the trade-offs that we'll be faced with? If art reflects our society and our relationship to it, how does technology reflect who we are? What does AI and the direction we're taking it say about us? At the moment, the cynical part of me thinks it's saying we have no patience or humility, shortcuts are good, and that we're okay outsourcing our thinking and our creativity to Google. We have access to so much information. How can we balance information with mystery? 
creativity, imagination, and self-expression are soul activities. They're soul expressions. They are what make us human. If we don't do it, we're not honoring our soul or our purpose on this earth. And it's true that for a lot of folks, technology is creativity. Code is beautiful, even magical. I just don't want that type of creativity to usurp the kind that gives us the smell of freshly cut wood, the chaotic sounds of an orchestra warming up before a concert, or the experience of standing before a painting and seeing the artist's brush strokes. AI can't breathe and push. It can't breathe and push. I don't really want to live in a world that values the virtual over reality, even if that reality is messy. However, we are headed toward that time faster than our regulations and ethics can keep up. That's the scary part to me. It's not the AI itself, it's, it's us. Over and over again, I come back to a really simple idea. Just because we can, doesn't mean we should. Science marches on blindly without regard to the real welfare of the human race. Does anyone know who said that? I'll read it one more time. Science marches on blindly without regard to the real welfare of the human race. It was Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, <laughs> in his manifesto back in the mid-90s. Yeah. So I think the momentum is so strong, it's too late to say, maybe we shouldn't. We can't fight it, really, and I don't necessarily think we should. But we are at a crossroads, and there's still time to make a choice. We must choose to preserve our humanity and creativity and make that our highest priority. priority. <laughs> our souls depend on it. Thank you.